Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. My name is Ahmad Thani Walla from Rehan School, Rangi Campus. Today I'm with Michael Ballard from Canada, Toronto. So let's welcome our guest. So, how are you, Michael? I think you are. I'm very good. Thank camera. you. We're having some lag. I'm trying to change the definition of transmission so we have less lag. And it seems to not okay. want to let me. Where oh, there I we go. Put ad, okay? There. I just changed the, the DPI to 360 from 480 and will, seems to be a little better. Okay. Introduce yourself, my friend. So I'm Michael Ballard, and I talk to people about resiliency. And resiliency is about how your beliefs and values, your attitude, your faith, your family, your surroundings, your neighborhood, your community, your country, impact how you define yourself in life. Not necessarily good or bad, or right or wrong, but it's easy if you and I were side by side in the same room at the same time. If somebody came in, it's pretty simple for them to go, oh, there's Michael, he's an older guy, and there's you, you're a younger guy. That's pretty simple, and that's safe to describe us that way. But then we have to be careful because some people, based on age, describe themselves incorrectly. At 39, I found out my 12-year-old neighbor was smarter with computers than the computer guy I paid $400 to work on my machine. So if I was ageist, I just said, oh, I have to have 30-year-olds or 28-year-olds or 48-year-olds with designations and degrees. But my neighbor's father found out that I had a little trouble, and he said, my son's been playing with my old technology since he's two. So let him come over and see what he can do. And no money. You volunteer enough in our community. He's going to help you because you help the community. Okay. I gave him a piece of chocolate bar and a $20 bill because he saved me another $300 or $400. So he fixed it in 20 minutes. The other guy took two hours. My 12-year-old was smarter. So we have to be careful how we define ourselves and others because they can get in the way of our success, our health, our happiness. Now we have to pay attention to those around us because not everybody is kind and safe to be around. But self-definition. So I'll give you an example. I'm now past 50 and 60, and I'm getting close to 7-0. And it's exciting to be here because a long time ago, I had cancer. Now, one of the skills of resiliency is called disidentification. Do you own the problem, or does the problem own you? So a small example. We were having lag on our video audio a minute ago. If I didn't know how to disidentify, I might have just gone, oh, can't do the interview. I'll come back another time. I'm overwhelmed, and that's okay. So instead, with disidentification, I go, hmm, I think I can change my transmission settings. Let's go from 720 and 480. Let's go down to 360. That seems to have resolved it. Anyways, to be silly... Who needs to see this face in 4K? I don't really care. So disidentification, do you have the problem or does the problem own you? If the problem owns you, it's okay to visit that state. When things initially appear, it's overwhelming. Heart races maybe. It's scary. But disidentification said, yes, this happened. It visited me. But I'm not going to live there. I'm going to do my best to find solutions to manage it, give it away if it's totally out of my control, or find a solution. Three different approaches. So can I solve world hunger? However, I'm talking to a company that does hydroponic growing in old shipping containers. So in extreme climates, they put them out there whether it's far north where it's, you know, just 45 below Celsius or nothing you're not familiar with, 45 plus Celsius. In that case, they'd have to shade the containers. 
but then they can grow vegetables and get people vegetables at a good cost because there's almost no transportation. You put these containers where the people want food. So disidentification. You own the problem, the problem owns you. So that's a big one. That's the number one thing of being resilient or asking for help to help somebody help you do that. So that's where I get started. I'm a cancer survivor. I got told many times during my battles that I was not a normal cancer patient. And I think that my parents teaching me, they didn't call it disidentification. That's from a mental health professional using that term. But they taught me to. It's okay to visit the land of nothing you can do, feeling helpless and hopeless. But who can you ask for help? How can you take care of 1% of it or half percent of it, but not let 100% own your life here and here? And how can this help? How can friends and family help? Anyways, that's part of what I do. Yep. And uh, also, <clears throat> I see a thing that uh, you're saying that uh, if the problems on you, you're looking like you were happy with me. But uh, at the time, I right now, I package the internet. But uh, there's some technical issues with coming. But I resolve it. And that's a practical for me. So let's move towards the questions. Okay. How we uh, how can we define resiliency in the context of personal development and growth? Excellent question. Resiliency helps individuals. Okay, I'll use me as the example. At 17, chronic illness diagnosis, it was not fun. I might have been the only 17-year-old boy in my high school who had fat pants because my belly would swell three inches. So I had everyday pants, and then sometimes for a month or two, nothing, and then for six weeks, it hurt like a son of a gun, and I'd have it hurt a lot, and I'm bleeding. So at first, the doctor said, there's nothing you can do. Helpless and hopeless. Over-identification. I am my illness. The illness is me. And then... Thinking back to my parents, my grandparents, do you own the problem? Does the problem own you? Oh, I'm letting the problem own me 100%. But the doctor said, a little voice, he's a doctor. He's an expert in physical, but he has nothing to do with my spiritual faith, my family, and all the things they know. I went to a new university down the street and as much as Google and Google Scholar is really good, you can't beat a librarian with a master's in library science. Here's my illness. What do you know about it? What does the library have for research on dealing with chronic illness? Oh, Michael, a couple of universities have published papers. And as a university, we subscribe to those papers so our medical students and nursing students and mental health students can access. Wow. And we're having a fire alarm test today. So... Here's the beat. Anyways, so the paper's research taught me that if I practice skills, some of which I learned in phys ed class, all of them aligned with faith, some my parents talked to me about, and my martial arts teacher taught them, I could have 20% less symptoms, less intensity, less frequency, all remarkable. I practiced them, and within a year, I went three years with no chronic health issues. But when I went for my yearly checkups under the microscope, I still had the disease. Quite a remarkable transformation. So personal development, resiliency helps us with grades. Resiliency helps us with graduation rates. Resiliency helps us with our physical health and our mental health. It can also help us with our income levels. I was the first person in Ontario to get hired by an international company that had 30,000 people Everybody before me in business development had a master's degree or an honors degree. I went to community college, which is all about functional basics. Get your hire Michael. He'll be productive very quickly. I was the first one. Oh, a, a, <laughs> part of being resilient is nurturing and being loved by others, having pets. It doesn't work for everybody. A couple of my friends have allergies to cat fur and dander. So I understand that they can't have cats and dogs in their life. 
but they do appreciate and they go out of their way to take allergy meds and visit friends with family and friends with pets because for short periods of time that's possible so resiliency for personal development and professional development educational development and managing their health and life very important great question thanks Thank you for providing the question. And uh, so, guys, let's introduce Cookie. Hey, Cookie, how are Hello, you? Cookie, are you the cutest one in the family, Cookie? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't resist. And Let's by the way, I used I used to play that uh, play a piano, but not that one. Okay. Let's move towards the question. <laughs> ah, key skills. Excellent. So I talked about disidentification. Do you own the problems? The problem own you. Now, breathing. There's dozens of ways of dozens of breathing skills, but the number one basic skill that we should all learn and practice four times a day, because it calms the brain, calms our heart rate slows our body and mind down is belly breathing or diaphragmatic breathing. So thumbs, fingers interlocking on your belly button. You breathe in on four seconds, hold for four seconds, exhale on four seconds. It's very basic, very powerful. So thumbs together, fingers interwoven. And I tell you that this is to remind you that brain, feelings, body, spirit are all woven together as one the one thing i don't like about western culture is we see them as separate they're all a unified unit now is it a little fun to separate sometimes yes of course but health wise we're integrated that that on your belly button breathe in on four seconds Hold for four seconds, exhale for four seconds. That's one one skill. Another skill, and maybe you and I should have another one of these where you do get me to practice seven skills. Can we circle back in the next couple of weeks and do that? Can't hear you. Okay. Yep. Even yep. I can do the meditation. Oh, you are carrying on? Sorry, it's. Uh, I think you are hanged. Okay. So I was saying we should do this again in a couple of weeks where you get me to do seven resiliency skills. So, so belly breathing or diaphragmatic breathing is the very formal term, but belly breathing because, you know, whether you're three years old or 87 years old, everybody knows what a belly is. So then there's triangle breathing. It's a cousin of diaphragmatic belly breathing. You imagine a triangle in front of your face, your finger at the top. You breathe in on three. Hold for three. Exhale on three. And so that will also calm you down. Now, you can move it from three to four, and if you really want to calm down, never while operating a vehicle of any sort or riding an animal. We don't want you falling off and hitting your head. But this is when you're sitting in stable or sitting against the wall on the floor or because it can lower your blood pressure because the goal is to calm your mind and body down. Before an exam, calm your mind down. To quote a young man in grade three, he told his teacher that he had to practice belly breathing and triangle breathing before tests because it helps his brains come out on the test. And he's right, because it lowers our stress and anxiety and helps our brain to function at its best. So triangle breathing can be three in, hold for three and three out, but it can also be to lower and rest more, four in, four hold, four out. And it can also be, if you really want to be mellow, Five seconds in, five seconds hold, five seconds out to slow down. So some people do three in, hold, three out. Some do four in, four hold, four out. 
and then they do five, five, and five. That can really help, to quote my neighbor, chillax you. Relax you, chill out, whatever you want. And then maybe you're feeling a little slow and in a slump and tired, and you just need a burst of concentration for five or ten minutes. Well, instead of five, five, and five, or three, and three, or two, and two, you do you do two. <sighs> out on two. So in on two, hold for two, out on two. And that should raise your energy up a little. And then if you really want to raise your level up, it's not a triangle. It's a, rect it's a rectangle. In on two, <sighs> out on two. In on two, <sighs> out on two. So rectangle breathing, no holding, just in and out. But you have to be careful. Again, no motorized vehicles or pedal vehicles or riding an animal. I don't want anybody falling off and hitting their head. So that's the third one. Fourth one, it's called, It's this is a big one. This is about practice, pre-framing. I learned this from my phys ed coach, my music teacher, and several others and pre-framing i'm going to use me in phys ed class as a 13 year old my dad taught me softball i played baseball for six or seven years between five years old and 13 years and we were the number one team five out of seven years not because i was extra skilled but because i had a good coach my dad and the other people excelled but i had fun i get to high school and suddenly my dad didn't play football, didn't teach me to catch a football. And suddenly, even though I got big hands, I couldn't catch a football. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I was all hands, and the football's got a point on it. Because remember, in North America, we call it football, and it's got two points on the end. The rest of the world calls it football, and it's a ball that's round, black and white often, but different colors for some. I love what we call soccer. The game is so skilled, and the footwork is profound. But it was 1960s, soccer ball and football thrown at me, and, I'm, and I was fumbling 10 out of 10. So pre-framing is a skill of seeing things before they happen. So my phys ed coach, Mr. Sargison, Michael, they're going to pull their arm back, and throw the ball with their fingers on the laces and put some spin on it for aerodynamics. You're going to see the ball coming at you. You're going to put your hands up in the air. You're going to see it coming, and you're starting your hands wide. You're bringing your hands in closer. As the ball gets closer and closer, your hands are shaped in a V. You're going to grab it, and you're going to hold on. So I went from zero catches out of 10 to seven or eight after only practicing 20 or 30 times. That's pre-framing. What are the steps that are happening around you, towards you, and what are the steps you take for the best experience, for the best outcome? So music class, I played piano and trumpet and euphonium, which is a miniature tuba for people that don't know what a euphonium is. And I got told to practice, practice at half speed, practice at double speed, practice at the regular speed, practice at two thirds speed. And by practicing at different speeds, when it was time to play, it was much easier. I'd already practiced it and got good at the tonguing for trumpet when playing too fast. So practicing at regular speed was easy. And thank you to Selma for the kind words. And so it's really important that we look at pre-framing. Now, a long time ago, a man called Shad Helmstetter, Dr. Helmstetter wrote, wrote a book called Self-Talk. This is another major skill. And self-talk is, what do you allow yourself to say here? Because it's the most important conversations you will ever have are not what you say to others most of the time, unless it's asking for help for safety. It's the words and the conversations you have with yourself. So before we went on the air today, I could have said, who is this guy? Why does he want to talk to me? Doesn't he know I'm busy? Or I could have said, how interesting. He's interested in what I'm interested in. I believe in mental health for everyone. 
And these are basic skills that are very powerful, but really aren't that basic because we don't talk about them in society. And if we teach them to everybody, it would change the quality of the experience we all have growing up and being adults and aging. So I've worked with three-year-olds and seniors in a nursing home. One nursing home had me there with their senior seniors, 88 to 103. And self-talk was one of their biggest problems. These people had survived a war, survived a concentration camp, got to Canada, had careers and raised families, and but now they were 88 to 103 and their bodies were aging and things were starting to work improperly. Eyesight, hearing, plumbing was not working properly or at all. Not fun to have to wear a diaper at 93 when you've got a PhD, you've been a university lecturer all around the world. It's humbling. So their self-talk was something we discussed that it wasn't nice, it wasn't easy, but unfortunately, it's part of growing older. So I got them to laugh at aging. I teased them. I said, at 27, I had to have a lot of surgeries because of my cancer. That went on for five surgeries till my 30s. I got an advanced lesson in being older. So yes, it's not fun to have to wear a diaper. It's no fun to not be able to go to the bathroom and you have to wear a diaper. It's no fun at all. But if you accept it and do all you can to manage it, it makes it a little easier. Because fighting it takes a lot of emotional, physical, spiritual energy. You can do what you can, manage your diet. So example, I said, maybe you shouldn't be having salads for supper. It should be for lunch. Because you, know, you don't want to have to run to the bathroom at 4 in the morning when you have mobility issues. is isn't going to happen. Anyways, pre-framing, framing, self-talk. How do you speak to yourself? Is it respectful? Is it looking, is it pre-framing, looking for solutions? Is it in a calm voice? Or do you talk to yourself as, well, I was stupid. Oh, what an idiot I am. That's not going to make things get better. That'll keep things bad or make it worse. So my music teacher paid me a compliment at the same time. He gave me some insights into why I couldn't be number one trumpet player in the symphony band and the concert band is because, Michael, you have the most incredible sense of rhythm of anybody I've taught, and I've taught thousands of students. However, you don't appear to have the ability or the discipline to play number one trumpet because that's the instrument that leads the band. I'm the conductor. There was no strings except bass, so there was no first violin. So trumpet, first trumpet was the leading voice of the of the band and the concert band so he said that's why so it's a huge gift but it's not one i can use so that's why you're second all the time and i know in an emergency you can be number one but you're not number one so those are some of the skills yep and uh, my that's good because you are providing some exercises with us and uh, I will suggest you meditation and uh, you are imagining you are in a yes uh, yep you are sitting on a forest or a good place a waterfall area so you can yes. imagine the places on your meditation yes thanks Razum for the comments this gentleman made it possible you can tell everybody to join the group in Facebook. We have a Resiliency for Life group in Facebook. We have a Resiliency for Life page as well. In the group, in the media section, we have over 200 skills and quotes and things to inspire you to be more resilient. Okay. So, my friend, it's time for now. And what is the thing you suggest to our viewers they can implement the thing in their life ah i think one of the most important things you can do is read biographies and autobiographies so mostly i read autobiographies and biographies of successful people but i've read a few books about criminals who made major mistakes but were very smart but they lacked the the morality to keep us all safe. Robbing art galleries and not hurting anybody is wrong, 
but I learned about their incredible IQs and how they got caught because they were arrogant 14 years later. I think it was 14 years. Anyways, so I like to read biographies and autobiographies of successful people. Some of them have been dead for 200 years, but some of them are still alive. And then the odd biography of a criminal, because I, I, I want to learn what made them think. Why did they get successful in crime and they got caught? Glad they got caught. But recognize that they were evil because they lost their way or they thought it was a shortcut to success. So I can't stress enough, I read biographies. I also, to be resilient, look at quotes. And that's something you'll find in the, um, the Resiliency for Life group is 100 plus quotes to inspire you to be resilient. Because I believe that we should look at those that have gone before us and their insights on success. Do I like the values and morals of some of those people in other areas of their life? No, but there's an old saying that I grew up with is you don't throw out the baby with the bath water. So they might have been not a nice person here, but had wisdom over here. Oh, thank you. Yes. See, I, you got you, you got fans, admirers for bringing people on the air. I see that. So I like quotes. Uh, I have a little bit of poetry I read. One of my favorite all-time books is either called The Greatest Salesman in the World or The World's Greatest Salesman. Now, it's a sensitive topic, but in the book, there is a prayer for business development people and salespeople. It does not, I repeat, does not replace faith, but I think it supplements faith. Having gone through my seven-year cancer battles, one can become weary, and the last thing I ever wanted to do was do prayer by rote. Just saying it because it's, no, I want to say it with intention every time. So this gave me one more thing to say, one more prayer to have. Now, it wasn't a formal part of my, my faith, but doctor, he's not a doctor, Og Mandino, the author, made me think in a way that, well, he said it differently than my faith raised me, and he said it differently than my parents and grandparents and my mentors did. So it gave me new insights. So in my late 20s and 30s, early 30s, when I discovered Og Mandino's greatest salesman in the world, oh, creator of all things, help me for I go out into the world naked and alone each day. And without your hand to guide me, I wander far from this path that leads to success. And it goes from there. Powerful, powerful words to get me to pay attention, to live in the moment, practice my faith, stay respectful to self and others, and be open to learning. Wow. So what do you read? How does it nurture you? Do I like to read fiction that's silly? Oh, absolutely. It helps calm this down, but I like to read books where the characters are so well developed by the authors that they're like real world. So it's not putting me into a fantasy world. Nothing wrong with that for those that read it, but for this is for me. I want to read real world books. So the crime novelist that read, that talks about police work and detective work and real-world criminal behavior in a fictional setting, wow, amazing. So that's me. So autobiographies, biographies, self-help, Og Mandino, books to inspire. Now, there's a book about communications that you do really well already, and that's a book called Zapp, Z-A-P-P, -P. three versions, educational version, healthcare version, business version. I gave the health education version to my daughter's principal when she was in grade four, Z-A-P-P, -P, two Ps. And he told me, Michael, it's the first time a book kept me up all night. I thought, oh, that's nice. One of my, one of my students' parents gave me a book to read. He's already, yes, he'd already won awards as a principal. He would already was beloved by teachers and students and staff. He said, but oh, Michael's a, Michael seems to be a smart guy, so I'll read the book. He said, I stayed up reading the book from 11 at night till 5 o'clock in the morning. That man is remarkable. So to give you the 15-second overview, Zap is that when we talk to one another, there's only two ways we communicate. We gently lift each other up, or we go for power and control, and we push down. If we're lifting up, 
we're going to engage and uplift and learn and share. If we push down, we're going to control and keep you at a distance to show you who's in charge. Got it, bucko? <laughs> I have learned, as I said with the 12-year-old, that every age has something to teach me. I, tonight, will work with some high IQ students, and it's fascinating because, you know, I've worked with five and six, three-year-olds at a time, or a room of 40 kids between three and 16 at a, at a summer camp for foster kids or a summer camp with grandparents' kids. And so I'm used to lots of kids in different ages and IQs, but these kids can take a one-hour lesson and chew it up and be done in 20 minutes and be good at it. <laughs> So, you know, you got to stay humble because I'm there as the guardian slash teacher. But there they are in grade seven and grade eight. And they're as or smarter than me always. I'm just the subject matter expert in an area where they have less experience. But they even have a guest grade four student who's come in for six weeks. And after six weeks, he's gaining on the grade sevens. And they're all like, oh, I said, maybe you should do your homework a little more often and more and, and practice because he's gaining on you and he's three years younger and three grades younger. What are you going to do when he passes you? So I got competitive. I laid the, the gauntlet down and said, hey, careful. The young guy's catching up to you. So it's interesting to practice and it's interesting to do but to me i see resiliency all around me i have a clothing store i live near and the man went from being a sales clerk to store manager because they said you have the best customer service skills we can find in the whole mall but i don't know how to be a store manager we don't care we've hired you because your customer service skills are the best and i agree i used to teach retailers customer service skills as part of my retail consulting job back in the 80s and so they said, we'll bring in somebody four days a week to teach you how to be a manager of the store. But we hired you because your customer service and communication skills are the best. So part of being resilient is being open to new experiences. Yes, it's scary. Yes, it's tiresome. Yes, it can feel awkward. But he's learning. And as I go by and wave at him all the time now, he's like, hey, how are you? I said, I'm great, but I'm not sure I'm as smart or as handsome as you are. And he knows I'm being respectful and silly. So now he's introducing me to his customers. That's Michael. He lives close by. He's really respectful and friendly. I like him. He makes me feel good about this job. Because why not lift him up? He's 45 or 50. He took a big risk going from store clerk to store manager. This store is going to be $500,000 to a million a year in volume soon. What new opportunities could that lead for him in a couple of years if they open up a second store or a third store? He could be part-time store manager and part-time part regional manager for three or four stores because this company is going to grow. They're doing an amazing job with men's clothing. Anyways, so that's what I do to be more resilient. Thank you, my friend, for sharing these interesting type of things. So it's time for end our episode. So guys, see you soon with the new episode with the new very special guest and you are a very very interesting and so happy man that's a good thing so guys see you soon pakistan zindabad inshallah pakistan will grow in the future we will grow the future hello from canada bye, bye to you